I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, National Forest Day, part of National Forest Week. First time that a group of us in Guelph have decided to do some foresty things. I'm Judy Brisson, president of Nature Guelph. We acknowledge that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of several First Nations. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon covenant to us land and offer our respect to our First Nation, Métis, and Inuit neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. Orange Shirt Day is September 30th. Orange Shirt Day is an Indigenous-led grassroots commemorative day intended to raise awareness of the individual, family, and community intergenerational impacts of residential schools. The orange shirt is a symbol of the stripping away of culture, freedom, and self-esteem experienced by indigenous children over generations. On September 30th, we encourage you to rare, wear orange to honor the thousands of survivors of residential schools. We welcome you all. This event is free, but donations are always welcome. You can donate to Nature Guelph or Pollination Guelph on their websites or on Canada Helps, canadahelps.org. You can email Guelph Urban Forest Friends to arrange donation, guff at gmail.com. Guelph Urban Forest Friends works through education and advocacy to maintain and increase the health, integrity, and area of Guelph's urban forest. Nature Guelph connects people with nature and inspires them to celebrate and protect it. Pollination Guelph is dedicated to the conservation and development of pollinator habitat for current and future generations. And there are a few more National Tree Weeks left to uh, happen. We've had several already. Uh, this Saturday, the Green Legacy Tree Nursery, which is the County of Wellington Tree Nursery, is open for tour of the greenhouses, take a nature hike, or help transplant a tree. And the Green Legacy Tree Nursery open house is part of the Taste Real Rural Romp. Yeah, you can find more information on the Rural Romp website. Again on Saturday, September 4th, Trees for Guelph is doing a tree planting in the Court Wright Hills Natural Area on Hazelwood Drive. Uh, you can go to the Trees for Guelph website to see a map and uh, you, you don't have to pre-register. You can just show up and help out. Bring a shovel if you have one and make sure you wear sturdy footwear. And that's Saturday morning from 9.30 to 12.30. And also on Saturday in the afternoon is the Yorklands Green Hub Tree Festival. There'll be hikes, talks, artists, children's crafts, and more. You can park on York Road or take York Road bus number four. And you can find out more about the Yorklands Green Hub Tree Festival on yorklandsgreenhubs.ca. Right, and for those of you who want to experience a little forest, there is a group in Bloomingdale, which is about uh, 20 kilometers from here in Guelph. And there is a nonprofit group that is going to be planting a little forest on Saturday, October 1st and they're looking for volunteers. So if you want to take part in actually creating a little forest, you can contact Marjorie at, the email is on the screen or you can give her a phone call. So I'm going to remind you all to mute your mics, turn off your videos and post all questions to chat. This presentation is being recorded and it'll be available within a few days on YouTube. So I'm going to ask Claire Erwin to introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. Bringing this event to you to, to welcome you and tell you a little about Joyce Hostin, our speaker for tonight. Joyce believes that we can transform our cities, one garden, one neighborhood, and one little forest at a time. She's a rewilder who dreams of wild yards, green streets, and wild parks. She's co founder of Little Forest Kingston, a member of a Thousand Islands Master Gardeners and an adjunct professor at Queen's University in the Master of Health of Earth and Energy Resources Leadership Program. Joyce works with groups to co-design resilient, ecological, vibrant landscapes that reflect the spirit of place. Her design palette includes layered plant communities, native plants, natural materials, edibles, and soil food web. And in her words, any day that she gets her hands dirty, either on the land or in the kitchen, is a magical day. So thank you for being with us this evening, Joyce. We are very much looking forward to learning how we can create little forests in our urban yards. 
Thank you so much, Claire, for that introduction. And now I'll just share. Okay. And uh, it's how, but it's also why I get a little philosophical. So let's start by imagining that it's 2030. And in 2030, every child can look out the window and see trees and the magic that, that those trees invite into the city. On even the hottest days, children can walk, wheel, or pick berries along a tree-lined street. And this graphic is actually from Calgary, Sustainable Calgary did a kids reimagine school streets. Can you imagine the school street instead of what we have now? Every child can experience magic in nearby green spaces. Magic, what is magic? Magic in its perhaps most primi pri primordial sense is the experience of existing in a world made up of multiple intelligences. The intuition that every form one perceives from the swallow swooping overhead to the robber fly hunting prey, the luna moth overwintering in leaves, forest ants planting spring wildflowers, hornworms hosting brachnoid wasp babies, predator beetles lying in wait, to the caterpillar on the tip of a leaf, and indeed the tip of the leaf itself, is an experiencing form, an entity with its own predilections and sensations, not just for other persons, but for other sentient organisms, albeit sensations that are very different from our own. As David M. at Abram spelled as sensuous, but I threw a lot of those extras in because just all of these different creatures that surround us. There's a book called Lost Words, and it, it starts with once upon a time, words, and I think about those words as magic, began to vanish from the language of children. Wren, acorn, willow, moss, fern, dandelion, bluebell, raven, heron, goldfinch, otter, kingfisher. They stripped those words from the Oxford English Dictionary for children because they thought they were no longer relevant. More necessary were words like copy and paste. This red-headed woodpecker in Ontario might be one of those words because it's endangered now due to loss of the forest habitat. Only 17 to 25%, depending where you are, of our indigenous forests here in southern and southeastern Ontario remain. You can see how sparse it is on this map. We've lost our forests. The first day, one of the other co founders, Maureen Buchanan, who also co founded the Kingston Indigenous Languages Nest, one of the plantings from last year was on um, Highway 15. And she shares a story about the first time that she visited Highway 15. And the first language that she heard, it wasn't English. It wasn't Anishinaabe Moan, the language that she is trying to recover. It was the language of the spring peoples. And she said that what that taught her was the importance of all the languages of the land. And we often call that biodiversity, but I really like thinking about it as all the languages in the land and welcoming all of those languages. Melissa Lukashenko, who's a GUI author from Australia, she says, I am earth speaking, talking about this place, my home. This earth speaking is a small, quiet story in a human mouth. And I like to think, maybe I'm earth speaking. Maybe that's something I'm striving for. These are some monarchs gathering at the edge of a forest where I walk. Dwayne Donald, um, a Cree from, and he teaches at the University of Alberta, he poses these questions. He suggests we ask these questions. And I think these questions are very relevant when it comes to um, little forests for urban yards. And the questions are, where is here? Who am I that I am here? Who else is here alongside me? What gives and sustains life here? How can I participate in the life that is here? And how can we live well together here? So first, where is here? Dwayne Donald again says, if you want to understand Indigenous knowledge, you have to un understand the ecosystem that the people come from and have lived within as a network for thousands of years. The better you understand the ecosystem, the better you understand the wisdom tradition of that place. 
And so I think for us to plant little forests, for us to return some of the magic back to our cities, we have to look back to this indigenous wisdom and to all and to learn and connect with the land. So how many of us know the name of the forest that once covered this land? We still call it this forest, but we have very sparse remnants of it. I didn't know the name of the forest until a few years ago, and I don't still know the name of the forest in Anishinaabe Moen, for example. So the forest that I'm in, I'm in Kingston, is the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest. The forest more south is the deciduous or Carolinian forest. And we're kind of on the edge now in Kingston where we always had some a few Carolinian species, but we're expecting more with climate change. But just to know the names of these forests and how many of our children knows the, know the names, but not just the forest, but within the forest, we have ecoregions. And as a master gardener, I used to always think in terms of planting zones, but really more relevant is the ecoregion that we live in and planting within that context. And even more, you know, getting even down closer is the ecosites. And so cities, we too often level the city. If you go in a forest, you'll see all of these different microclimates, these different elevations, these different soil structures, and that some of those still remain. So when we're planting little forests and urban centers, understanding a little bit about ecosites and the one that you will be planting in is really helpful in choosing the right little forest. I'm going to play just a very short video um, and the um, introduction mentioned dish with one spoon. The, the dish with one spoon, the responsibility that came with that belt, where everybody that was in that um, wampum, where we shared all the, the land and the resources, but we all equally shared with that, that spoon. It was a treaty between the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee and other nations as well were involved. And what it talked about was how they're going to live together in peace and harmony and how they're both going to be able to eat off the same dish using one spoon. So for example, this is my rabbit. And then the Métis will say, this is my rabbit. And then the Ojibwe will say, well, it's my rabbit. And then you have everybody saying, this is my rabbit. And they all believe they have a right to that rabbit. Poor rabbit. And so the rights-based agenda that these organizations have are really detrimental to our relationships with each other and our way of life on the land, which is what the Dish With One Spoon talks about. It's not a, it's not a rights-based relationship or agenda, but it's a responsibility-based friendship that we have with each other. So responsibilities, responsibilities, not just to each other and to other humans, but to the earth, to the land on which we live, and to all those beings on that land. Now, who am I that I am here? Well, I, my family originally settled in Alberta from the Ukraine. And uh, we actually started with some very extractionist, um, you know, in the early 19th century, we had a mine, the Hostin family, we had, uh, you know, the hoist up the river valley and lost it all in the depression, which maybe wasn't a bad thing and became farmers. And so I'm now consider myself like an Alberta farm girl. We didn't have much money and we foraged and grew most of what we ate. I ended up here in Kingston, and um, this 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 land was Haudenosaunee, stewarded by Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek for many 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 years. Um, now now we've leveled again, cut down most of the trees here. I live in suburbia, so this is the house when I moved in 30 years ago. The yard, as you can see, was carpeted. That's asphalt, or semicircular driveway, two wings, enough to park three car cars, a motorhome, and a boat, a lot of asphalt. I worked in high tech for many years, and I always thought like, you know, I felt like I was doing such a good thing because I was really fighting for human-centered design, um, people-centered design, working in high tech and trying to work, make technology that works for people. And then I realized that since I'm no longer working in that world, that human-centered design was really the wrong thing. I should have been earth-centered design, multi-species-centered design. And so that's what I work for now. 
And my journey towards relationship with the land started with the summer and mud when we filled in the pool and I allowed the kids unlimited hose time with the piles of soil that we brought in to fill in the pool. I did have critique such as my mom says you should be spending more time cleaning and less time in your garden, one of my kids' friends said. And uh, my neighbor, I had some challenges with him who's talking about Fergie, Fergie, there's bugs over there, dirt over there. He saw dirt and bugs versus relationships within the soil above and below ground. My spouse, he wanted a normal front yard. Um, and the first few years he went out of town. So I got started in the front yard. And you, as you can see from here, it wasn't a forest to start. And I live in a forest, not technically a Miyawaki forest because that's now, I didn't know that, te that, that technique at the time. But, um, you know, when I started, I was thinking it was about me and I was planting and picking all the things, made a lot of mistakes, but fortunately, I got help from um, maybe creatures wiser than me, the squirrels being some of them. And you can see there's three black walnuts, those arrows are pointing at there. Those were trees that they planted. They planted black walnuts, they planted oaks, they planted hickories. Um, I've got maples, so I've got a whole forest that I didn't actually plant but that the, the uh, squirrels brought in. Brought in lots of leaves, it's fall, so watch for those leaves, because if you're going to plant a little forest, those leaves are like such a gift to the earth, and the people who toss them out, they're throwing away the food for the trees, so keep all your leaves, and I used to go sneak out at night and early in the morning to take them, and now I drive right up to people and grab them. If you look across the street, that had been a... Um, a very uh, pesticide herbicide at uh, mowed grass and then the homeowner moved and a new one came in grabs ate the ditch I was allowed to plant a few things but then uh, the squirrels all you're muted Joyce Yeah, I think my internet rebooted on me. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'll share again. Okay. So let me know just in case that happens again. Hopefully not. We don't usually lose internet here. Anna Singh, an anthropologist, says meaningful sustainability requires multi-species resurgent. That is the remaking of livable landscapes through the actions of many organisms, humans being one of those organisms. This came through my Twitter feed this week, and it was came through as in, look, this is a handprint so it, showing the um, organisms on my child's hand after they were playing outside. So you better make sure you wash your hands when you come in. And I'm sitting there. This is this is micro This is their micro microorganisms that our bodies partner with. That we are we are like more than humans. We're really in relationship with others. And so it's not about this is bad. This is actually really good that the contact with the soil. There's actually a new theory called the urban microbiome rewilding hypothesis, which is really emphasizes why we should be planting these little forests. And you can see, you know, from our ecosystems as we've cut down and and just lawned our cities and, and paved our cities. They now think that that is really linked towards the lack of biodiversity in our guts, which links to many of the illnesses that we are experiencing. So who else is here alongside me? This just is one example of who's alongside me. This was probably at least 10 years ago, so it's changed a lot since then. But this was well after I got rid of my driveway. And you can see walking up that pathway, turning left at the fork there. A lot more native species than I used to have when I got started, going towards the front door. Um, there's a hop tree on the left, spicebush swall swallowtail, a, a beautiful Carolinian species there. When you look out my office window at the time, one morning I look out and there's a saw wet owl there. Those are just some of the different things that as we plant these little forests that we will be experiencing. Who else is here? And the insects, the insects. We'll be experiencing so many insects. The sound and my yard, 
the fireflies at night, these all come when we plant. So what gives and sustains life here? There, Richard Wagamis, an author from Wabasimong in the Independent Nations, he's now um, no longer with us. You can see those hummingbirds. I don't know if you can see what's coming down their mouth, but they're insects. He says, I've been considering the phrase all my relations for some time now. It's hugely important. It's our saving grace in the end. It points to the truth that we are all related. We are all connected. We all belong to each other. The most important word is all. Not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me, speak like me, pray like me, or behave like me. All my relations. It means every person. Just as it means every blade of grass, rock, mineral, and creature. If we were to collectively choose to live that teaching, the energy of that change of consciousness would heal all of us and heal the planet. We do it one person, one heart at a time. We are connected. We are the answer. That was uh, one of our plantings last fall on Highway 15. Andres Weber says, we share the same trembling for an existence. Its future is unfolding. It's flourishing. These are feelings that any autonomous living creature experiences. How can I participate in the life that is here? So here's where we get to the little forests. We participate, I believe, by restoring the land. And even more important than restoring the land is our relationship to the land. So it's not about planting trees. It's not even about planting forests. It's about that relationship that comes with that work. And this was a poem written by Jason Harrow, the poet laureate of the city. And he came out and he wrote this poem for the trees. He came out to a planting last fall and he didn't read it to the people that were there. He didn't tell us he was there. He just read it to a tree. I declare today and each day after to be little tree day. From this moment on, I promise to only write poems about little trees. I promise to do whatever a bird tells me to do. And when someone asks me a question, I will answer them by rustling a handful of leaves because like the wind, my voice is a guest who has traveled a great distance and is only passing through, unable to stay. So connect to the land, listen to the land, learn about its history, learn about the plants, the animals and insects that share the land with you. And I noticed I'm using it, and that's a very English thing to do. In Anishinaabe Moan, the land is living. They wouldn't ever use it. And these are just, and I can share them afterwards, but these are just some suggestions about how you might go and do that. And Susan Samard, who wrote The Mother Tree, go find a tree, imagine linking into it for a network. Um, there's um, a um, meditation that you can do that, again, I link to by Shawnee and Pete, and then um, a relational walking practice. These are different ways of connecting to the land, and I think that's important as part of the work of planting a forest. So on the left was my blank slate, and it's like thinking about, like, you know, my land, a blank slate, you know, it's empty, I can do Versus, and this is where I'm trying to transition my own thinking, the land, the ecosystem, the wild being that I'm stewarding and with whom I am in relationship. So that's the land in which I live now on the right hand side there. And it's changed since then quite a bit, actually. Robin Wall Kimmerer says, knowing that you love the earth changes you, activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, loves you in return, that feeling transformed the relationship from a one-way straight into a sacred bond. So if we learn from some indigenous wisdom about that relationship, that the earth can love us as well because it is living, then what? how does that change us? So Gavin Van Horn, he says that one conception of wildness is simply the acknowledgement that land has a will of its own. While this is a question that begins a dialogue with the land, what does this landscape want to be if given the opportunity? In Kingston, this land was once forest. That's what this land wants to be. So how much of that forest can we invite back to the land? And these are just some images from Wild Seed Project in the States. And while they're not little forests as such, I think they still help us to imagine the possibilities. 
a front yard, a food forest, a strip mall, a bank. I would actually back where those three trees are there, I would do a little forest back there. An interior parking lot. And this, I think, is a real opportunity for little forests, especially in very dense areas. If we can rip some of these off and plant little forests and have little parquets like this. This is just, I took some pictures yesterday just out among um, really just walking distance from me. And we see things like that. And you think they ever sit in the front yard? I've never seen people sitting in a front yard like this because it's not inviting. And look at all that space. It's like room for actually a big little forest. This one has one big tree and that big tree, that's, a, that's an elder now. There's no little trees. There's no new generations growing up here. This one again, this one has more trees, which is great, but it's only one layer, one level. And most of them again are getting older. And where is the next generation? Our yards are dominated by lonely, often non-native male because of the you know, clonal species. How many of these Norway maples, all clones do we see? And that's one of the causes of many of our allergies, actually, because those male trees put a lot of um, allergenic pollen. We seek backyard privacy by building fences and planting monoculture hedges. This is my son's, and you can see, like, that's a big cedar hedge there. And leave our front yards exposed for the sake of curb appeal for people driving by, like, that makes zero sense. I much prefer soul appeal. Imagine yards with soul appeal or earth appeal and this is my front yard uh, yesterday and uh, that we sit a lot on those two chairs a lot because it feels like a sanctuary so much we don't use our front yards and it's because they just don't invite people my husband i don't think i'll read this whole thing who originally wanted a normal front yard says the thing he most appreciates about the yard is that in every season there is some pattern to see some structure that breaks the monotony of grass and flat fields of snow and ribbons of asphalt and bringing the wild back into the urban spaces is empowering attainable and i hope will soon be common so my winter wonderland will stretch as far as i can see and he was very resistant at the beginning so for those of you who have uh, either a neighbor or a spouse or someone you're living with that really is like they want a normal front yard, there's hope. This is a 14-year-old Miyawaki forest in Japan. So think about that cedar hedge you just saw and you think about how that makes you feel versus how you would feel walking down this path between these two sides of a of a Mia Wacky inspiring forest. It feels like a sanctuary. Dr. Akira Mia Wacky, he's the one who came up with the Mia Wacky method that has inspired Little Forest and it inspired um, many forests, which Can Plant has been working on. And that I think there was one plant at last year, well, there was one, two plant at last year in Guelph. Disturbed land, it takes 150 to 200 years for it to become a forest. Dr. Kuhn Mirwaki said, we don't have time for that. And he said this 35 years ago, and we still haven't done near enough. So how do we do that? He said, within 15 to 20 years. And this was the method he came up with. And after the tsunami in Japan, he actually, they took it a step further. And along the coastline with all the rubble from that tsunami, they piled soil on top of that. And they used the Miyawaki method to plant forests on top of that, because they discovered that after the tsunami, the places that were most resilient to that were the ones that were protected by forest. So that has now become a climate adapt adapt adaptation strategy in Japan as well. So what it does is you skip all of these mid-successional times. You skip like the early successional all the way through and you plant what is a late successional forest right away. So you're going right to all the species of a full forest ecosystem. And it's also saying that, you know, we're working with native plant communities, not with um, so much of the trees that you, if you go to a normal nursery, you'll find are not native, they're clones and they're male. And these native species, they 
live in, they prefer to live in community. Now, when I see trees on streets, I think, oh, you're lonely. When I see a single front tree in the yard, it's a lonely tree. Trees cooperate. So competition is part of it. Some of them won't make it, but it's all part of regenerative planting design. There's natural regeneration. And if we wait 150 years, tree islands, that's another technique that they have been experimenting with after a clear cut or to reforest. And they discover the tree islands. And I almost think about a tree island as little Miyawaki forests, like um, kind of done in islands throughout a, a big space. They actually quickly end up connecting together because they become seed sources versus a plantation. So in the Iwaki forest, there's four layers. There's the canopy, there's tree, there's shrub, uh, understory and shrub. And this one also sh shows the urban ground layer. So you can see very different than how we plant today with them very widely spaced and a single level of the canopy trees usually. And most important when you're starting, it begins with the soil. And you can see on the right hand side, how quickly all of the decomposition of these leaves is happening. And that's because that's soil full of life versus on the left, if it's been degraded, if pesticides, or herbicides have been used, if there's not been food, like if the leaks, then the leaves get raked off every year, it's not got the vibrancy of life. So the soil, I always add like, you know, corner half an inch of compost, a thick, thick layer of leaves. Again, it's fall, perfect time to go out and take leaves from everybody who doesn't value them. And um, lots of arborist wood chips. And the little forest we plant, we do six inches of arborist wood chips as the top layer as our mulch. Then you have a diversity of little native trees and shrubs. We're used to planting these big caliper trees or the, the trees from the nurseries. They will never, never, never do as well. They will never thrive as well as these little one-year-old seedlings plant it. You know, and especially if they're planted and you can see they're, these are root prone in that the roots hit the air. So you've got a very dense root system, ideally with their um, tap root, if they're tap rooted. And you're planting these one-year-olds, but within 10 years, the, the, like before 10 years, they'll have surpassed any bigger tree that you plant. So if you have patience for a couple of years, you'll see a big um, change. And growing from seed, because again, those other trees, what happens is their roots are trimmed if they have a tap root that's trimmed. And you can see the root system. This is a red oak on the left where the tap root was never cut. It was from a, from a seed versus on the right where it was from a nursery with the tap root is cut. Just no comparison in the root system. And you think about the resilience of the oak on the left versus the oak on the right. Seed sourcing, um, we source a lot of ours from Verbinen's nursery and they grow all of their trees from seed. They grow native from seed. They source from like, throughout Southern, Southwestern, um, Southeastern Ontario. So you end up with a mix of seed things from different seed zones but you won't have it from radically outside of the seed zone because the seed zone matters in terms of the growth of the seedling as you can see from the red oaks from the very different conditions from Niagara versus Algonquin. Um, and with climate change, what Forest Ontario recommends is 50% of your seedlings, the seeds come from very local and the other 50% from one or two seed zones south. Mycorrhizal fungi, if you're not familiar with that, that's the magnificent, like you think about the mushroom as a flower, the mycorrhizal fungi is actually the true, like kind of the big living being that lives underground and all trees partner with that fungi. And um, you can see the root systems on the left versus the right without the fungi versus with the fungi. If it's a mature forest, that's already there because all trees partner with it and it will come over time. But if you're planting an integrated system in an old pasture in an urban area, that will really, you'll bring it in right away by, you know, that you can buy um, um, root rescue and you put a pinch on every seedling on its roots and that introduces the fungi that those trees need. The method is very dense planting, like it breaks every rule you ever heard about how to plant trees. 
just think um, three per square meter, three layers in each square meter. If you're doing a tiny area, you know, maybe spacing further apart, the larger ones, the full Miyawaki forests, we're planting at 100 square meters, we are following this method. And uh, I, I kind of like this picture. It's from Tectonic Safari, and they were reimagining like along street trees. And what I like about this one is you see the three layers. You see the tree understory shrub. The difference, if it, it was done the wacky method, would be it would just be much denser. But you can have like a four meter width and um, you know four times twenty five to four hundred meters, and that is like a a true neo wacky forest if you do that. Craig Holbridge, and he's um he's a Gotian scientist in the states, and if you were really interested in learning Gotian science, which is a different way of seeing the natural world that is a lot closer to indigenous ways of knowing. And he talks about now seeing plants within a sea of relationships. And this, this could be an oak tree on the left, growing in a big field, and an oak tree on the right. So this notion that trees need space, well, they need space, but the space could be up. It doesn't have to be wide. And then underground, as you can, you probably most of you have seen this prairie root systems. All plants take up different roots. They, they're, they're, they're at different levels. They take water at different times. And so there's a lot of cooperation where we thought there was competition before. So trees don't act as individuals, they act as a collective. This is Robin Wall Kimmerer. And indigenous wisdom, they knew this. Western science is just starting to discover this, that what happens to one happens to all. And we start together, we feast together. And so this is just a little bit, you can see where they're looking at in Western science above, where trees can really be working at different levels within the environment. So the Miyawaki method results in much faster growth. Some things, you know, they say 10 times the growth. Um, in Japan, I think they've seen 10 times the growth rate, like 10 times faster. We don't know here in Ontario because we really don't have the years of experience. We planted a number last year in different parts of Ontario. The ones that you plant in your house, if they're less than 100 square meters and don't follow the exact methodology, they probably won't grow as fast, but they'll probably still grow faster than any other conventional method that you might have tried. So this is just how you can expect it to go over a little bit of time. So they're springing up around the world, and here's just a few. This was just a school planted last year, and um, my bottom right is covered, but it's in, in the UK. Here's Utrecht in the Netherlands, where it's right outside a university, and it's for biology students to study in. This is one in India. So you can see a little forest can be quite big. Uh, this wouldn't be a homeowner one, but it gives you an idea. And the sitting circle, I'm a big believer in sitting circles. Um, here's a circular one planted last fall in the United States in a park. Here's in London, and this might be getting closer towards just you know what a yard might be if you had an existing tree. They've taken the space between two streets and they planted a Miyawaki forest within between them. And that's the vision of what it will look like in um, maybe 10 years time. And this one has the meadow around the outside edge, a forest edge of it. This one isn't a Miyawaki forest, but I put it up just to show that, you know, apartment, a lot of people live in apartments. And why are we doing the mowing grass around the apartments? And the right-hand side is one from Seoul, where my daughter lives in Korea. And we could be doing that here and we could be planting Miyawaki, like these little pocket forests there as well. A place where we park our car. And so this one is one, two, three, four, I think it's nine parking spaces there. And my yard would have had that many parking spaces. I actually could have done a 400 square meter little forest in my front yard had I been starting from scratch, I might've done that. If you have one parking space, you can do it. So this was in um, in France, and they planted this last fall. So instead of those parking spaces in the middle of three streets, they now have a forest. They can get really, really, really small pocket forests. And so that's a word that's, um, I think it was in um, the Netherlands that they started first this idea of homeowner little pocket forests. 
And um, there's a new um, nonprofit that started a social enterprise in Ireland that started at the beginning of COVID. And they, there's a lot of areas that there's just no greenery in Dublin. So some of them, they're doing them in containers. And this is one of their little pocket forest containers, but they're also doing like a little teeny pocket forest out. Here's Heather, who may or may not be on the call, but this is a Guelph backyard little forest. So this is, and you can see it's not a really huge space, this backyard. And this is it planted last, um, maybe was November and December last year. You can see this is doing the three per square meter she did. And this is this summer. Now, one thing that is in here, and she's going to be moving these trembling aspens. So you can see some of these are quite tall. So one of the lessons learned, and we didn't plant any early successional spe species, and that would be like poplars, trembling aspens, um, silver maples, because they just grow too fast and overwhelm the forest. So it's mid to late successional trees that are planted. And this is another one, um, it's like Guelph well, Green Venture. And it's, uh, I, can't, I can't see because the Zoom thing is at the bottom, but this you can go visit. It's a public um, Miyawaki home forest, I think they call it. So smaller than the full 100 square meter Miyawaki forest and really could inspire you what you can do in your yard. You know, when they're getting big, when Chelsea Garden Show decides to feature them. And so this was outside the entrance of Chelsea Garden Show. Sugi, um, Pro Sugi Project, they are doing um, Miyawaki Forest around the world, and they did this one outside Chelsea. And uh, there was a couple of forests inspired, inspired there within Chelsea. This would not have the dense planting, this one here. And this woman, she was inspired by Miyawaki and uh, those Bosco Towers in, uh, I think it's Italy, and did container ones. And you can see it's for pretty dense planting. Not really a Miyawaki forest, but not lonely trees either. Choosing a forest type based on local ecosites, there is this, this document and an ecosites of Ontario, you can Google that. And I find this very useful depending on your clay, what kind of soil do you have and how moist it is. It can help you choose the forest. So each of those numbers, it points you to a forest type within that ecosites document. Or you can take it like High Park in Toronto. Um, they have their, their species list and you can see their trees and their shrubs there. That's another source of inspiration for choosing the trees and shrubs for your pocket forest. And you can see on the right hand side, indigenous peoples recognize High Park as an interconnected web of life, as a refuge for our relatives. There's relationships again, relatives. They're not things, they're animals, birds, insects, plants, fungi, and trees. So stewardship isn't about reducing the labor. So it's like the idea of no maintenance. That's not what it's about. It's about becoming relationship with the land again. And here's another one that if you have like really, and here we have some alvar. So very, really, really hard skate, very shallow soil. Um, there's a fellow in, in Toronto, Jonas Spring, Ecoman. And he, this is his species list for trees and shrubs that really can handle this harshest of conditions, including on balconies. So that may give you inspiration. Or um, Stefan Weber, he has this plants of 16 Mile Creek, Creek, Oakville, Ontario. And the Clay Ravine Bluffs could be a reference ecosystem in Toronto for a similar if you've got those conditions in your at your house. This is <laughs> And don't even try and understand it. I have a spreadsheet. It's available on the Reno Thousand Master Gardeners website. You can download it if you want and play with it. But this is like the percentages and everything. If you had enough space to do a hundred square meter forest in your yard, there's five species which make up your dominant forest type, but then like 35 species total. Those five species are 40 to 40, 40 to 50%. We did another spreadsheet, and this one again is available on the Master Gardener website, where kind of played with if we did homeowner ones and homeowners wanted to pick out and say, oh, I want to support wildlife, or I've got a really wet spot, or I'm Carolinian, or I want to do like nut edible. These were including the herbaceous and grass and sedge layer, kind of where you can pick and choose the, the different trees and the different layers that you may want to plant. 
So again, you can get that from the website. And I found this public works department in the United States that have done a couple of public ones and they shared for homeowners their own kind of set of pallets, which I think is like fabulous. And we should be doing this all over. Every city should have these. They called the this one ecological superheroes. And um, I can share this again so that you can send out, everyone can get um, access to it. I'll try and share my slides. Um, and including keystone species. So if you don't know what keystone species are, um, Douglas Ptolemy and oaks, willows, cherry species, pines, and poplars. Poplars, again, I don't really recommend because they're the early successional. So it'd be the oaks and cherries in particular for a pocket forest that you would want to include if you want to really, if the ecological super, like the, the all of the insects and everything were your primary purpose. So thinking about your purpose is really useful. So forager fantasy, I kind of just, you know, an edible forest. These are the species that all you can harvest from and you can eat. So you can do, think about it like a food forest for anyone who's not seen a pawpaw, that's what that is. Um, I found this, there's a, I think that's in Portugal when they actually did a fruit forest. They didn't plant all native species in here though. So I'm not sure it would do quite as well. And then what that does is that's looking back to again, indigenous agriculture from particularly Central and South America but they've now found them BC, I think they found 15 food forests where the species, the native species that had a lot of edible benefits for humans, the forest changed over time as humans stewarded towards those species. And so these are some of them where they found some of the BC ones. Pollinator buffet. So if you want to support the pollinators, that's a yellow-bellied sapsucker, which I didn't even know about until I saw it in one of my uh, black wallets one day. And it turns out like some of the early pollinators and stuff may be drinking on the sap that that um, yellow-bellied sapsucker releases. You want the giant swallowtail, that hop tree. So these are the plants that you can think about specific supporting specific creatures. Riparian water hog, I don't like the name that they chose for like a water loving forest, but let's say you're doing the rain garden or you have a spot that just sits wet for a month in spring, you can plant a little forest that would be specific around um, that challenge. All of them though, all of them, because they focus on native plants, they support much more biodiversity than any non-native plantings that you do or that you might already have. Adding a forest edge. I think some of the ones you see on the web, there's too much focus on the forest itself. Often it's in a square rectangle. You know, think a little looser than that and have a meadow around the edge because a lot of biodiversity happens in the ecotone, which is the transition between one ecosystem and another. So for the transition between the forest and that meadow, and it's like, it adds beauty. So look at that edge between this meadow and the forest. And soft landings. So again, a lot of those trees you see, they're in grass. So even if you plant an oak, if there's only the turf grass on your leaf, those insects come down and there's no place for them to overwinter. So having soft landing, this is basically a diverse native planting underneath with sedges and other species. And of course, wood, having wood along in your little forest because wood, in addition to all the insects that it brings in, the ants that plant the forest species, and support the birds. Think about mounds and pits. If you walk in a forest, there's mounds and pits. I created mounds. You can create mounds by like burying wood to get up to your soil, add wood and put your soil back. And then you've got some of those mounds and each of those becomes a bit of a microclimate. But, and I also think it brings back some of the topography that we had before the bulldozers cleared it. Now that doesn't look like much right there and I think it's spring and a, a few years back, but this is now that same spot. There's a pine grove over there and there's more trees to the right and a stump sitting circle in the middle. This is a front yard. I can be completely enclosed and private in that front yard. This is another spot in the front yard, another sitting circle. Create sanctuaries. And as your forest grows, when you spot holes, rather than worrying about pests, say, hey, 
Awesome. This, that in particular one was from a leaf cutter piece. So celebrate them as a sign of the diversity of life that your forest is inviting into your yard. This is, um, if you live anywhere near um, Trent, this is Lower Trent Conservation Area last year for the first time. They offered five and they did fairly large little forest kits, um, 60 some native species, maybe they'll, I think they'll offer more this year. Um, we just did uh, at Kingston Promenade, we did a little flyer up and we had a booth and we were focusing on pocket little forests and ours we're looking at 10 native trees and shrubs, so pretty small ones but also saying that you can buy more than once. And depending on your space, you just add them together and then you can have a diverse little pocket forest. And so we call them rain gardens, small spaces. So if you've already got trees and you can't afford that tall tree layer, then the lower layers, edible buffet, birds and pollinators. So just to finish, let's invite magic back into our cities. Let's plant little forests. I, I invite you all to go out and now plant a little forest in your yard. Or if you don't, you know, if you've already got something, a neighbor or find a friend. Mel Melissa Lukashenko again says, big stories are failing us, but we are citizens and inheritors and custodians of tiny landscapes too. It is the small stories that attach to these places, which might help us find a way through. And just, um, just remind you again about the microforest planting in Bloomingdale that was mentioned at the very beginning on October 1st. Marjorie's awesome. We've gone back and forth. You know, she sometimes has questions. And really, there's nothing like experiencing the planting. So go out there and plant. And then there's also a webinar coming up on October 5th, Im Implementing Nature-Based Climate Solutions in Ontario. I've got 10 minutes in it, but more interesting are, um, now I'm going to see, Gordon Harrison from Climate Network Lanark will be talking about work to get na nature-based solutions into their county climate action plan, which I think we all need in all our cities. And then Jen Court, um, Executive Director of Green Infrastructure Ontario is talking about more building more nature-based solutions such as green roofs, biosoils, and rain gardens. Questions? Thanks so much, uh, Joyce. Um, I'm Sue Reachin, and I'm going to read some of the questions. So anybody who has a question, and boy, I can bet there would be lots, um, please just post it in the chat, and I will raise it with Joyce. Um, and just a comment that uh, Kim made that she loved your beautiful questions that you posed at the beginning. So you asked us questions. Now we get to ask you a few. <laughs> so question number one is, uh, where could gardeners find their ecozone to help with deciding what trees to plant? Um. I need to bring up my browser. There's some, um, the easiest way is, well, ah, okay, let me open the browser. It's the Gene Conservation Something of Ontario. You can actually go and click on it and find, um, um, Let's see if I found it. Yeah, Forest Gene Conservation Association. No, that's not it. Okay, I'm going to have to look that one up. Okay. But try Googling um, um, EcoZones of Ontario, EcoZone Map of Ontario. Uh, yeah, there's Ecoregion GeoHub, Ecoregions of Ontario. But I still find that other one the most useful. Oh, so that's... Judy here, uh, birdgardens.ca, which is a gardening for birds uh, group. I think they have the link for that map on that site. It's called birdgardens.ca. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the one I'm trying to think of which is why I really want to think about it. And maybe afterwards, if um, you can send it out to all the participants. What I like about the one I'm, I'm flanking on is they actually, you can print off a list of tree and shrub species for that eco zone. And that's the only place I've seen the tree and shrub species that's specific. 
So I think that that because your ecozone is also got like micro ones. And so this is a really useful one. So if it, if if I find it before we're done today, I'll post it in the chat. And then if not, um, I'll share it afterwards. OK, thanks, Joyce. Uh, there were a couple of other questions about sharing slides and stuff after. And you did mention that you would share your slides. Hopefully, the whole thing can come out together. Yeah, and then I post it in the chat. Somebody asked about the website. It's the Reno Thousand Island Master Gardening website that actually has the spreadsheets and stuff on it. So I pasted the link to the page that has the spreadsheets on them. Okay, okay thank you. So here's a, another question, and it's slightly different. If most start to use this compressed forest planting Maya Yaki, Maya Waki method, what will happen to the other? species and communities of annuals, perennials, summer greens, and the wildlife related to them that would have grown otherwise. So if you're in an area that is a prairie and Ontario has some prairie habitat, Ontario also has some savanna habitat, then we don't plant a forest. Then you and this goes back to um, learning the land that you're on and learning the history of the land that you're on. And if you look back at that, then um, then respect that and then plant a prairie or plant whatever it might be. And then even when you do do the forest, those forest edges, um, those are opportunities for some of those pollinator plantings and stuff. And I think that's some, something, you know, I hear always about pollinator plantings and so many people don't seem to realize that trees and shrubs are really important for pollinators as well. And in fact, some of the earliest um, um, food for them is in things like the, the birches or the, the red maple and um, those early flowering trees. Okay, that's a good reminder. Thank you. Someone asked uh, some tips for protecting mini forests from rabbits. So that's, uh, that's um, we use spiral wraps and you do have to protect them from rabbits. So the Miyawaki method, they protect for the first three years. Here we do the spiral wrap after it um, freezes. Um, Astrid, another master gardener, she says that if you protect them too soon, then the voles can make their homes inside the spirals, and then they can kind of snack on your little seedling all winter, and then you have no seedling left. So after it freezes, if you've got deer, um, bobex, um, two of our sites, are they use bobex every three weeks to protect from deer, and if depend depending when you plant in the fall, you'd have to put an application on that before the deer, before the protection goes on. And then you can wait again until spring to apply it again. Bob, could you explain a bobbit? Bob X, I'll type oh, the name Bob in X. the chat. Yeah, Bob X. Yeah. Uh, Joyce, I just want to say there's a dealer close by uh, off of Highway 6 going towards Hamilton. Bob X Canada. He's great. Okay, thank you for that, Marjorie. Okay, um, here's another question. How do you handle volunteer plants that are invasive? Um, again, that's uh, first three years is the biggest risk and just watch for them and when they come remove them with the little forest we plant it we're leaving um we've got a number like we've got asters and golden rods we're not weeding those out we're leaving the milkweeds and the golden rods we're leaving species like that unless you know when they're like, it's still the first year so if and it's canada golden rod at lakeside we might remove if there's just too dense around the seedlings and shading them out, but most of it we're trying to leave. And then the trees will eventually shade out, um, shade out those species, and then it will transition into the more forest shade species. Okay, thank you. 
Here's a comment from Kaz. We planted a little forest 20 years ago with sugar maple, chinkapin oak, redbud, pawpaw, spruce, hemlock. We have not had much success with planting understory plants. Any hints on what could work? And how dense and how shady is it? And I would love some chinkapin oak acorns if anybody has some, because I can't have been able to source chinkapin oak. <laughs> but yeah, it, it would depend on like the the shade level um, and the density. And it, I think it's a little bit harder. So the Miyawaki forest to the shrub layer is, I think it's 14%. So it's more of the minor portion of it. Um, maple leaf by Burnens, um, the um, the honey, there's two native honeysuckles, both low growing. Um, one of them, um, bush honeysuckle suckers, actually they both sucker. So they can really, I, I was at a place that they had um, forest honey, um, the bush honeysuckle that came in all on its own and it was all along the edge and it was just gorgeous. It was just covering the ground. So those are a couple and um, in terms of um, the understory, trees uh i think you said you had red but so you do have understory trees the alternate leaf dog would be, be another one if you don't have that one um car, car the beach beach wood there's there's just i don't know it's just but there's not a ton of those low shrubs that can handle a lot of shade and i think in a miyawaki forest over time There'll be fewer, like at the early spaces, some of the red elderberries and things like that. You could try red elderberry and see, depending on the sun, whether or not, you know, does it thrive or does it go back? Um, the, the, flowering, the flowering raspberry, that would probably be one. That spread really, really well in my, my um, forest. Um, and um, Heather and said in hers, which is the early one that you saw, like the backyard one that you saw, that's like really kind of going gung ho back there. So that's a quick spreader. And just make sure you get more than one because they uh, they need more than one to get the fruit. Okay, thank you. That's a good reminder. And Nina asks, what's the name of the nursery you mentioned earlier where you can get small trees planted from seed? Do you, do you have the name you could put in the chat? Yeah, Verbenens. Verbenen, okay. Yeah, and for Benin's, their retail, that's their wholesale um, nursery. Their retail is Ontario Native Plants, the online nursery. And I was talking to them because we have a big order in with them. And I said, well, what happens? Because we have um, at the Princess Street Promenade, we have probably had at least four people that are out of town and that have like acreages with multiple acres. And they were wanting to do this. And so they were wondering, could they get them directly from Verbenens? And Verbenens said that if the order is too big for Ontario native plants, it immediately gets kind of directed over to their wholesale arm Verbenens. And so, yeah, if you got a good size order, that's where it will come through. Okay, Verbenen. Yes, that's just north of Waterdown, I think, isn't it? Or in that area? I could be mistaken. Yeah. And I just saw someone mention bladder nut. Yeah, bladder nut is like awesome. I love bladder nut. Okay. Uh, somebody's asking about the city right of way. Should they worry about planting there? Um, well, it depends. <laughs> Does anyone say don't do it? Um, mine, I didn't ever kind of really pay too much attention about where, and I've got a ditch in front. There's no like sidewalk in front of my house. And I'm not even clear where it is. So I'm sure a chunk of my forest is now on city property and the city and the ditch across the street actually is all on city property. Um, the city actually now, and there's been um, bylaw battles that have gone all the way up Ontario court system. And it was ruled that citizens have the right to garden in the right of way. So we do not have to grow grass, but um, trees like, the city is responsible for those trees. And so I would think, I mean, I can't say do it and I won't say don't do it, but anything that you plant here is also at risk of being cut down. And so do you wanna risk that? So I don't know. And you can also contact your city and say, this is what I wanna do, is that okay? 
Okay, thank you. I know around our neighborhood, sometimes there's sight line concerns in the uh, city property. And as long as it's not too tall, it works fine. And people can see down around the corner from another street. So. Yeah, and sight lines, sight lines, and that's an interesting one because a lot of cities talk a lot about sight lines. Corners is important for sight lines, but actually along the street itself, it's been demonstrated and it actually slows traffic down to have trees like along the street. So it can actually, it would like, it's beneficial to have four sight lines on the street itself. And I think it's Kitchener that actually you can, you can get like one of those neighborhood grants to put planters right along the edge of your street for that purpose to kind of make cars slow down because they see there's something there. So they just automatically kind of slow. Great idea. Uh, somebody else has asked for the address or email for the pocket little forest kits to purchase. Is that possible? Well, are, are you in Kingston area? Because <laughs> we're not shipping or anything. And we're taking, it's going to be pre-orders for spring. But our little forest, went, um, little forest Kingston at gmail.com. So that's our not very fancy email address. And our website, which is kind of just in transition, but is there, um, is littleforest.org. So the four, like, proper, if you want to use that word, Miyawaki forest that we planted last year are on there. Um, but nothing about the pocket forest is on that site. To see the species list and stuff, that's on the um, Master Gardener, the Reno Thousand Island Master Gardener website. So it sounds like there's lots of room for somebody else to start an initiative following your example in this area. Yeah, somebody had said to me, Heather had mentioned that maybe Green Ventures was offering pocket forest kits, but I went on the website and couldn't find it. I found like seedling kit, like, like start seeds. And so you can get seeds like nuts to start, but I didn't see um, forest kit. So yeah, like any of the forest groups or ecological groups down south, it would be worth um, trying that. Okay, thank you. Is there a list of species for dry clay soil or do we just need to amend the soil? Uh, well, okay, so you're amending every site that you plant. So that's one, um, but amending is how do you define amending? So how I define amending, how we're doing it in Kingston here is the no dig, you layer on um, the leaf and yard waste compost, or you know, I guess you can use manure, the straw, the hay or the leaves, and then the wood chips. And you let that sit for a year and, uh, or six months or three months or over the winter if you do it right now, and your soil is now amended. So that's really, because you're not going to change the fundamental nature of your soil. So you're living with the soil that you have. If it's dry, all of that organic material is going to make a huge difference in keeping in the moisture. And so it might be like an upland, you know, there on the eco sites that has like upland um, dry. So those there's there's a lot of species that do well in upland dry clay. And um, at Lakeside, we're 97% clay. We did our soil test, 97% clay, but as clay as you can get. The nice thing about it, and the nice thing about clay is once it gets wet, it holds water pretty well. And with that thick layer of mulch we had, we actually, and we had, I think, six week drought, we didn't have to water this year our little forest, which was super amazing because that was going to be a lot of work. <laughs> Yes, this year there was a lot of watering done. Yes, yeah. someone else is asking if you know of any organizations in Toronto that Torontonians could partner with around Little Forest. Um, I there was somebody I was on Fresh Air last week, and somebody emailed after that. And somebody actually stopped by on the Princess Promenade from Toronto. And I said, write Toronto on your thing and I'll try and connect you with that other person from Toronto. So maybe you Toronto people just have to get together and start a group. I know that there was a, the Toronto District School Board and there's Nature Canada. There's a networking group that's been on pause because the person is um, 
um, away on illness right now um, throughout the summer. But there was um, someone from Toronto District School Board that was trying to get them in the schools. Um, so I can reach out to her. So if anybody wants to email me and say, if you can, and I know Heather from um, Dugan and Associates, she might have some Toronto people on her list. Um, she's from, you know, Hamilton area. So that's more like, how do we start connecting people with each other that we were talking about that yesterday? How do we kind of, kind of keep making these connections? Yes. Okay, so there's room there for a small group to get together and start it. Okay, someone asked about their sandy yard, but I think you answered that in terms of amending the soil. Someone else. Yeah, amending the soil and make sure you plant species that are, you know, uh, there there would be certain species that you would avoid, but if you look on that eco site map, it'll tell you. But yeah, and the amending is the same things, right? Okay, someone's asked if you could speak a little more about keystone species, what they are and their significance. So if you Google Douglas Tellamy, and I'll type him in the chat, um, he's got, I mean, he seems to share his talks pretty widely on, uh, he, he allows them to be recorded and shared on YouTube. And he's got a number of books. He's really was, and I don't know what his, background is. I don't think he's an ecologist, but he really has brought home through studying the insects, um, the relationship between the insects and the native plants. And so oak, for example, that is the number one keystone species because, and I I think it's 600 and something um, moths, and he focuses on moths and caterpillars, like the caterpillars and for the moths and the butterflies. 600 and some on an oak tree. And if you think about, you know, you saw the hummingbird feeding its young with insects and the most nutritious, the highest protein are caterpillars. So chickadees again. So it's the, like the whole food web. And we, you know, have always thought too much, you know, insects are bad and we got to get rid of insects. Insects are a foundation of the, of the, I don't know, food web of the web of life. And so oak supports more of those than any other tree. And then willow, I think is number two and the prunus species. So we've got a number of native prunus. So the black cherry, the pin cherry, um, um, I think the Canada plum, the American plum, those would all count uh, under the prunus species. And so there's different layers of those that you can, can plant. Um, and then cranial wise, like um, the Canada goldenrod, the goldenrod is considered cranial wise a keystone species. And I had, a, I was out with a group of education students at Lakeside today, and the Canada goldenrod was just teeming, teeming, teeming with all of these different insects. So if you go out there and you look, and you'll see which and. Now I'm pretty harsh in my yard. I still have non-native species, but if there's one that nobody is visiting, nobody, if I never see anybody visiting it, then that one's gone. <laughs> so it's like, no. Nope. And this is part of the conversation with your land is like getting to know it, getting to know who visits and who likes to eat one. And <laughs> Thank you. That's a, a great hint to get out there and look. Yeah. Uh, someone else, John, John has asked, if you start with a lawn, how do you prepare the planting bed? Um, start with cardboard, cardboard or newspaper layer, a thick, you know, a good layer down there. Or actually, you don't even need to do that if, because people will be putting out their leaf bags, get out there with your car and like go nab all those leaf bags. And then I'd rip them open. Because then that that bag itself, there's no tape, there's no staples, there's nothing to remove. So you open them up and you kind of spread out those leaves and then you hold that down with wood chips and compost and let that sit. And then uh, in a few months, it'll be all beautiful and ready to plant in. 
Geez, I have images of people in the dead of night with masks on stealing neighbors' leaf bags. <laughs> well, as I said, I used to do it in the dead of night, but now it's like people want the people who don't want their leaves, they're happy if you come up and take them. So now I just go yeah. up. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm just pleased to see that a lot of people are making suggestions and giving websites on this um, chat as well. So I hope people are clicking on those and maybe saving them. Um, someone else has asked, what is a spiral wrap? You mentioned that as something when you were talking about the rabbits and the voles, I think. Yeah, they're unfortunately plastic. Um, we did investigate the compo decomposable um, ones, but the they would be shipped over from Europe, and they were like really expensive once you added on the shipping costs, and it just didn't make sense to ship from Europe. North America isn't very good at any alternatives to the spirals. Um, I'm just finding a link to one. Oh, and this one says biodegradable. Maybe that's maybe the plastic does biodegrade. I don't know. There's some. Okay, so here's an here's an example. Um, you can see the the, the spiral. They're white and they're spiral. Can you use chicken wire instead of spiral wraps? Yes, you can. But uh, if you have like several hundred little trees, that's a lot of work. But yeah, you can. Okay. Um... Another person mentioned we talked about those rights of way and Barb was saying, well, may depend if the utilities run through it um, with yeah, gas. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about if that's a problem as people plant trees on their front yard? Do they have to check? Well, you, you, one, you look for the overhead. And so if you have any overhead, you can't plant anything that's going to go tall underneath the overhead. You can plant it to the side where you don't think it would interfere or you can, you know, if there will be a branch coming over, then it gets pruned. Um, so that part would be okay. And then the other thing is you should always get your til utilities marked about where your especially gas comes in. We just did with the neighborhood tree program, we did a tree equity program with the city. Um, and uh, they were offering, you know, in a neighborhood that lacked tree equity, two trees for anybody that wanted them. And next year, we're going to try and convince them to at least three that may have layers. And that goes to somebody mentioning, like, you know, if there's a leaf program kind of working through them, I think that would be great. Um, but she said, like, the water line actually doesn't matter too much. You have to have it just a couple of feet away from a water line. Um, but your gas line, you have to really watch for because you can hit that with a shovel. So you get those marked um, and then just keep it a certain distance away from that. It doesn't have to be really like far away and just be aware that if ever they have to come repair it, then that could damage some tree roots. You don't know how far that distance is from some of those. I don't roots. think it's terribly far. I think the more the bigger concern utilities have is more that you damage it when you're planting or doing any work. Versus okay. like the tree roots never, there's this myth that tree roots will go and attack things. You know, tree roots like soil. They don't like pipes. They don't like houses. They want to stay when well, they want to stay in the soil. So unless you've got a broken water pipe, they're not going to go in the pipe. So the city, I think, is not concerned about that. This concern is more just, you know, you're going to damage it when you're digging. And um, yeah, I'd have to, I should look up and see what the exact distance is, but I know the public works has said, I think it's just a couple of feet from like a pipe when it came to water. So it wasn't far. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone else uh, has mentioned something. Uh, are you worried about bringing in blight, et cetera, if you're using leaves from other people's properties? Uh, no, <laughs> because one, like they've done studies on wood chips, for example, um, Linda Chalker Scott, I think it's Linda Chalker Scott, she has a wonderful article about the myths of wood chips and bringing in diseases on the wood chips. And for the leaves, like they right now, I've, I've seen advice out there for the maple, the black tar spot on the maple, um, that you should actually throw out all your leaves that have the tar spot, you know, put them in somewhere and get rid of them from your property. 
And um, I'm not so much an expert on that, but Astrid, who's the coordinator of our Master Gardener group, I she's been, she's got such a depth and wealth of experience. And she says, and then I did some Googling around it too, things like that. They're all over the city. So, and, and they're in the nursery. So it doesn't matter what you do with the leaves on your property, it's all around you. And so it's not going to really matter. So no, we don't worry about it. Okay. Thank you. There's a number of questions about the spiral wraps. I, I can't recall whether you answered it. You're talking about chicken wire and can you use them on shrubs? And someone else says mice can eat around chicken wire. Um, do you want to just comment on chicken wire and spiral wraps on shrubs? Yeah, I yeah, with the spiral wraps, like shrub, yeah, spiral wrap isn't gonna work too well on a shrub, but the ones we had were like really little, so we kind of crammed it in the spiral wrap, so we kind of didn't do that. I saw Heather on the ones she did in her little microphore, she used chicken wires around the chunkier shrubs and then um the spiral wraps around the things that were single trunk. So you can do that, but I think I said earlier, like the spiral wraps after it freezes so the voles don't move in there. Um, mice going in the chicken wire, I don't really think that's an issue because it's not, the mice is when they make their house right against the, the tree that's more the risk than them coming in afterwards. Okay. So yeah, I think chicken wire is okay. Thank you. Uh, and someone was hoping to plant a meadow over their septic bed. Do they need to worry about root depth? Ah, uh, I think that depends on the type of septic bed. And there are planting lists. Um, there was a native plant person that shared. So I've got a couple of planting lists about things that you can plant on septic beds. So you can definitely plant on septic beds. I would not plant a little forest on a septic bed, but you're not talking about that. You're talking about a meadow. So yes, that's that is good. And I think they're often really sandy. So those like low growing meadows with um, the sedges and, and like the, this, the things like prairie drop seed, but like the smaller native grasses, I think those would all work. And I, they're, I'm trying to remember, I think, um, I'm trying to remember the website, Ecological Association, I'm blanking on the name of it. I'm pretty sure they have a really good septic bed planting list for meadows on their website, ecological. Um, I'll try typing and see if it comes up in okay. my. Thank okay. you. And someone else has mentioned about trees uh, from the city. Um, that's another thing to uh, investigate if you want a tree. And uh, there's a comment about the spiral wrap. Um, Another person, buy, where do you buy native grass seeds in Southern Ontario? Um, um, not for a while. Um, yeah, I had insomnia last night. My brain isn't working. Um, wild, wildflower farms. Okay. So wildflower farms has a lot of, and up here we don't really have good local sources. So if we want to order native plant seeds and grass seeds, um, there that that's a good one. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's all the questions listed here. There was lots of comments about how appreciative people are about your presentation, Joyce. And I know I was constantly clicking print screen so I could save a copy of all those wonderful slides you had with so much information. So, um, oh, there's two more new messages. Uh, and again, thanks. And Joyce, I would like to say thank you on behalf of everyone. I mean, your initial opening was so beautiful and your talk about not rights, but responsibility, I think really strikes a chord in our culture right now. We're, we're focused on so much other than our responsibility. And the idea that we should be earth-centered, uh, it was an absolutely beautiful uh, presentation with so much information that I hope will allow us to think about what we can do on our own little pieces of property or the properties that we share with others 
to rewild, reforest, and reinvite all those other species back in to live close with us. So thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Yeah, thank you. And I will um, I will share the slides. I've kind of got, we're trying to get natural infrastructure grant in for Tuesday. So probably it won't be till mid next week. And I'll try and remember the links and include those. And so then you can send them out to people. And I, my email, I did put in my, the chat earlier on. So if anybody wants to reach out directly, like feel free. Thank you. Judy, um, are you, you're recording. Are you going to post this up? Yeah. Um, the recording will be on both the Nature Guelph YouTube channel and the Pollination Guelph YouTube channel. It uh, may take a few days to get up there because there's some weirdo stuff that Zoom has, you have to do with recordings, but they will be up there. And I will attempt, if Joyce shares those slides with me, I'll try to figure out how to get them out to everybody that attended. So I do Is have there a way to also uh, share all those links that are in the chat? I, I will get the chat as a, yes, I can do that too. Great. The chat gets Thank saved as a as a document. Okay. So oh, and actually, I will type. Um, so slide share. I uh, slide share. I think is going a little bit more towards. Um, um, maybe. Um, sorry. Um, I hope that you can get them. Like it used to be all free. I think they might be trying to start getting you to subscribe but i think you can visit like one or two for free and so i have a slide share channel and that's just to make it easy because i haven't figured out another method right now i will post the slides there so you can keep an eye out on that link i just put in for the slides to come up so that would be one way of getting them if um just in case okay so i would uh thank joyce again and thank you all for coming I remind you that we still have a few more um Forest Week events. And I'll also remind you that Pollination Guelph, Nature Guelph, and Guff all have events during the year, and you can check out our websites for, for more of that information. So thanks all for attending, and uh, Joyce especially. Thank you, and good night, and happy foresting, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.